Welcome to the First Thought podcast at Galway International Arts Festival. I am Paul Fahey, Artistic Director of the festival, and in this series you will get a slice of the festival you can listen to anytime, anywhere. Tune in for fascinating First Thought talks, First Thought backstage, final hours and more. You can listen back to all episodes via GIAF.ie or find First Thought on any podcast platform. Jack. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure to have you here again. And um, my name is Tiernan Henry. I'm the host of Vinyl Hours as part of the Galway International Arts Festival. Vinyl Hours is, is essentially a series of conversations that we have with people, with our guests, about the, the choice of music or the music that soundtracks their lives or that is really important to them. Uh, it's, an, it's a terribly unfair thing to ask someone to reduce their life to seven tracks. Uh, or eight tracks or whatever, um, and then to come and talk about it and justify it. Not too much justification. But um, one thing that I, I like when we started doing this is I got a, Tom Waits famously said that, that songs are just interesting things to do at the air. And, um, and I think talking about songs as well is also an interesting thing to do with, with the air. So all of the choices of the, our guests, we put them up on Spotify and the Galway International Arts Festival Spotify homepage. So they're all there. You can listen, listen in later. Um, and if you like what you hear, please consider uh, making a donation to Galway International Arts Festival, which is a non-profit organisation that brings arts to people in Ireland and across the, around the world. Go to giaf.ie and click donate. That's the important, that's the, the technical business part. Tonight's guest ladies and gentlemen, is Robert Foster. He's a singer, he's a songwriter, he's a writer, and uh, he's also a, a muesli champion, which we may or may not get to. <laughs> um, in 1977, he formed a band with a friend of his, and um, the band ran for two big chunks of time, from 1977 to about 1989, and then from 2000 to 2006. And during that time, they made, as they described themselves, striped sunlight sounds, which is a great way of uh, stealing Bob Dylan's wild mercury sound, but also describes perfectly the sound that the go-betweens made. Um, they made nine albums. Now, Robert's also made a series of albums themselves in between and after the band. He's made eight albums. He's made some of the most achingly beautiful songs of the past 45 years. He's also written some extremely sharp and prescient and funny music journalism and criticism and obviously as well he's a muesli mogul <laughs> so please a big further ado without further ado will you please welcome robert foster once again <laughs> robert it's such a pleasure to have you here thank you so much for doing this and again my apologies for putting you into this terrible, uh, terrible absolute box, pleasure you know? absolute pleasure um uh We'll get going shortly, but I just really just want to say that your choice of songs is brilliant. Uh, you know, they, it's a really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. And it's all over the place, which which I love. Oh, you right, know. Yeah. And it's also one that isn't a song, kind of is, but it isn't. You know, so yeah. uh, we get there. So why don't we get started? We jump right in. Yeah. And um, your first choice is from a 1962 album. Uh, the song was written by Don Gibson, and the album is Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music. Ray Charles. Yeah. I can't stop loving you. Yeah. Um, I heard that. I was born in 1957. So I, um, I come from a, a relatively non-musical family. Like there was no music around me and um, no record players, no relatives played music or played instruments. The only thing that was really happening um, through the 60s for me in terms of music was the radio. And so there was a radio station in our house that was on when my father was getting ready to work. Mm -hmm. And so I was about five or six, and they, it was a radio, it was um, mixed news and music. And so they'd play a couple of songs every morning, and they'd tend to play the same songs um, over and over for a couple of weeks or months, obviously, you know, because they were hits. Yeah. Um, and that just was one, I know all the songs. Um, like something like um, Moon River by Andy Williams or, you know, and um, that just 
something about that just really... I'd know, obviously, at five, I had no idea what was going to happen in my life. But there was something just about that, his voice, the big... The, it was very romantic. Mm. It, you know, it builds from that. There was just something about that song that just completely floored me, you know. Um, years later, I, I sort of thought about it more, and it's sort of... You know, that's obviously a, a, like a, the backing singers are probably a, like very much of their time. You know, like Nashville, 1962, there'd be white singers singing on the beat and very white bread type yeah. singing. And Ray Charles is obviously moving around. And um, that might have got me, that sort of, those sort of very straight 1950s almost um, Mainly women voices, maybe, mm. and and him, um, huge song, beautiful melody. I was, yeah, just swept me away. Because yeah. it's interesting you picked up on the back and vocals, because a couple of your other tracks have interesting bits yeah. going on in the background yeah. as well that you've picked. Yeah. But one of the things I thought about this was because um, I read um, Robbie Robertson talked about when the, when they did the last waltz that they got you know they got Van Morrison to come in. Yeah. And they said to him, "We want you to do." Tura Lura Lura. And he right. said, oh, why don't I just sing, you know, when Irish eyes are smiling. And they right. said, no, no, you're going to do it like Ray Charles does it. Right, yeah. And it was uh, Richard Manuel <clears throat> had been listening to this album as well. You know, yeah. he's a bit older. But, you know, he'd, he'd listened to that and it was this mix of country with yeah. this, with the jazz, but the blues and that other thing. And you said, like, Ray, his voice moving around. Yeah, it does. His structure. Yeah, you know, and again, so I, I was listening to the last waltz earlier, and I thought, yeah, it's exactly it's Van Do's Tura Lura Lura, and it's a pretty much a carbon copy. Yeah, yeah, I think this this record was was I only got the the album years later, yeah. um, and I, I just it it's a very romantic sound, yeah. you know, and I I, th I think of myself as a five year old, and there was these big. Um, Big records, big sounds, and it was so. It's before the Beatles, yeah. so it's quite slow and luxurious, and it just entranced me, you know. And obviously, for him, it changed everything because it did. It, yeah, it, as you yeah. said, it it was very Nashville was white. The music, yeah, was it must have been white, extraordinary. And then suddenly, at the time, you know, yeah, for for yeah. Um, I imagine that they cut it in Nashville, and for um, a black guy yeah. to go down into that world. Uh, in 1962, yeah. must have, you know, been extraordinary. Yeah. Probably tough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I mean, he's he's because I know he talked to Peter Gralnick years later about it, and he said, he said his take, and it was, he said, you take country music, you take black music, you got the same goddamn thing. Yeah. yeah. He just said it's telling stories. Yes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously selling records. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which as well. <laughs> okay. We're going to take a bit of a jump for your second choice. Yeah. So we're going to go from Nashville, New York, yeah. wherever. And we're going to South Wales yeah. to Dylan Thomas. And it wow. goes on for 18 more minutes. <laughs> so please do listen. Try and find it. Well, it'll, it'll be on the Spotify thing. So, so, um, I, I, um, so we jump from 1962 yeah. to 1975. I'm at university um, in Queensland, um, Queensland University. Um, and I'm like doing my first year, and um, and I'm doing. I must have been doing an English literature um, subject. I did probably two of my first semester, and for some reason, in a tutorial group, which is, was probably about half the size of of the people here, um, we must have been doing Dil Dylan Thomas's poetry, and the person who was running the tutorial played that recording, which must have been on a record in a room. And the whole the tutorial group were like we were almost crying with laughter. Um, it's and and for me it was just like such a powerful thing. Um, and he just the voice for a start, I mean that's Dylan Thomas and I don't think anyone ever read their their poetry better than him. You know, he was a well known uh, reader of his, that's why recordings exist, because he read his own poetry so well. And so I'd never heard, you know, I'd been exposed to television, uh, I'd been to a couple of movies, records, but I'd never heard a voice like that. Uh, I still wasn't writing songs or writing anything, I was just a student. But there was something about that language, 
There was something about the mood. There was his humour. Um, like one, one small thing um, which always stuck in my... And I was just laughing in, in, you know, like in the, the tutorial. I, I, was, I found it so powerful, so funny. There's a, a later scene... There's very funny scenes in it that he, he also gives straight-faced, which I, I realised that he, there was something going on where you can give people an audience humorous material, humorous words in a non-jokey way. And so he was doing it very straight with the way you hear that. I found that interesting. And, um, and like, there's a, there's a bit later in, in, the, in, when, in the, the poem, like a long prose poem, where he's talking about opening the presents and there's, like, this really complicated train set with instructions. And he just says, you know, oh, so easy for Leonardo. Yep. And I just went, oh. He, I found it very funny. <laughs> It's not oh so easy for Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. It's oh so easy for Leonardo, and it goes by really quickly. And I picked it up, and I went, oh, okay. So you can take someone grand, and you can do a little in joke, yeah. and that really, is, you know, I use that to to this day. Yeah. You know, like my my wife knows about it. Something will come up, some complicated thing with the phone or something, and I'll go, oh, oh so easy for Leonardo. <laughs> you know, it still just rolls off. Um, and so it was just spoken word I'd, I'd never heard. Yeah. Um, and um, his love of language, his love of a story, all of these things really hit me. That recording, you know, like I, I have it at home and I listen to it once every two or three years yeah. and it just completely blows me away. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a screenplay as well, Do you know, because... It, it, he doesn't over-explain, as you see. No, and yeah. there's, there's all these asides, and he just leaves things and moves on. Yeah. And he talks about the aunts and the uncles. Yeah, yeah. And it's... it gives you a tiny bit about each of them. Yes. And then comes back and says something else, and you go, yeah. oh, there's, yeah. there's something, yeah. there's another story there. Yeah, yeah. And, and like when I was listening to it, I was like, I'd obviously never been to Wales, um, but I, I could just see it all. Yeah. You know, it's very visceral. It's, you know, he's talking about, and aunts come in and there's a fire and, and um, they visit a haunted house and, you know, the children. And it's just this sort of magical... Uh, it's very alive in front of your eyes listening to it. And there's, there's other bits in it that I kind of... I mean, I, had, I hadn't listened to it for donkey's years and I yeah. listened again recently. Mm. And there's, there's bits of sadness as well. Yeah. And again, he doesn't dwell on it. He no. He sort of, you know, you kind of get a sense that a couple of the ants, maybe things just didn't work out when they were yeah, younger. Yeah. And you're just giving it in passing that they sing a song about a bird's nest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After a couple of drinks. And yeah, yeah. And everyone laughs and we all yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, you know. yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. package of emotions that he gets in there. And, you know, like, and, and the romance, you know, like a child's Christmas in Wales, even just that, I find really powerful. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting about the performance of it as well. Because yeah. Because... Like, you know, you're, you know, you get into this space about should poetry should work on the page, or yeah. and as you say, it is a prose piece, mm. but it's it, it is poetry, yeah. and it should work on the page. And then a lyric, you know, the way people say, well, a lyric needs yeah. something else to lift it off yeah. the page, you know. Yeah. But this, when you hear this one, you can't unhear him. No, as you said, the, the, he's such a good reader, and his delivery. It's not even just his voice, but it's his delivery. It's everything yeah. about it, you yeah. know, and. And it, it, it kind of gets into that space of um, is, are we in music almost? Are, yeah. we, are we drifting into something yeah. musical maybe, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, like people say he was a mesmerising. Mm. You know, like he, he was reading in the 40s and 50s and getting hundreds of people. Yeah. And, and that must have, um, you know, just sort of revolutionised performance of poetry. Yeah. Because, you know, like you think of the other poets of that time, you know, like someone like T.S. Eliot, you know, like I've never heard him read his poetry, but, I, you know, like was not someone who was, or, you know, Auden or mm -hmm. some, you know, people like that weren't reading, mm -hmm. where he was like the first sort of, he went to America, you know, and yeah. um, a very good book um, on his time in America, which I read um, when I was at university, very, very, written by someone who's on the road with him. Um, when he was drinking and it was just a circus, you know, yeah. wild. But then he'd get in front of people yeah. 
and he could talk like that. And he is getting into his own work yeah. as well. That's that's the amazing thing. Um, and his love of language is just you know the two tongue C. You know, like I remember hearing you know, like what's that? Yeah. You know, like but it fits. Yeah, you know, and like it's, when he talks about the snow coming out of the ground. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, rather than just falling on the yeah. ground. Yeah, you know. yeah. Amazing. And I, again, what I was reading about it, when, when they made the recording, it was made in New York, and um, it, it's interesting because it, became, it came out as an album. So the first side was him reading the poems, mm. and the second side was just this. So yeah. before Blonde on Blonde, you know, we had an <laughs> album that had a, a single track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 19 minute minutes. track. Yeah, yeah. And when they were recording it, he came into the studio apparently drunk but didn't have a copy of it. So one of the women who was producing it went to the New York Public Library, got a right. copy of it from Harper's right. Bazaar, right. brought it in. He just said, record, and this is what we got. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So we're going to go back to music, um, and we're going to go to London. It's interesting, your first three are all twos, so 1962 to 1952. Now we're going to 1972. Yeah. And this is New York and London, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I heard you, you I heard, or you, you tweeted yesterday about this, that you, you heard this track in Heathrow Airport yesterday yeah. morning. Yeah. You describe it as otherworldly, yeah. which, it, which it is. Yeah. So, wow. Lou Reed, mm. Transformer. Um, yeah, I mean, I was listening, as I said, when we're talking about the Ray Charles track, I was listening to the radio. Mm. So I didn't have you know, an, an aunt with a jazz collection coming around. I, there was no bohemia anywhere near me. I just had the radio. Um, and so I brought music into the house when I bought a record player. And so I, was, I listened to the radio a lot. And, and I, I was probably... That came out in, in 72, 73. And to hear that on the radio at the time was a revelation to me because it... Because everyone on the radio, and still to this day, is very up and very chirpy and very full on. Mm. You know, it's the idea you've got four minutes, you're making a record single, you go for it. You know, like it goes right up to this moment. Where that came on the radio and it was like, I'd never heard a voice like that, I'd never heard production like that, I'd never heard lyrics like that. I knew who Lou Reed was yeah. and I was aware of Bowie. Um, but I didn't have a big album collection or anything like that. And, and just that voice, um, it's not... And, and besides everyone being very intense on the radio and the production right in your face and, and everything just slamming at you and, and the singer very upbeat or screaming or crying or whatever, this was just this... Um, it was obviously someone who basically probably couldn't sing, you know, and that, you know, like must have said something to me. And again, I would probably just picked up the guitar around that time when I was 15 or 16 when I heard this. And it was just that voice, just that sort of dry, really just sort of off-handed delivery. Um, and then there was, you know, the revelation that this was actually not some sort of art project, but this was on the radio. You know, seeing about, you know, like giving head and all that, you know, like so, you know, oral sex and all this sort of stuff going on that was also slipping under the radar. That was interesting, um, and it was, but it was mainly that the record didn't sound like anything else on the radio. And I liked a lot of stuff on the radio. You know, I liked a lot of pop, but that voice was just a, a turning point. You know, like uh, it. You know, like there must have been a part of my brain that went. Oh, you don't have to have a great voice to be on the radio. You don't have to play by the rules to get exposure, like really basic lessons mm -hmm. about where art can go. Although I wasn't writing songs, I was doing nothing, but that record entranced me. Yeah. I think it's interesting as well. It sounds like it's already going when it starts. Yeah. It's almost like you walk into a room and they're already there. Yeah. And you don't know how long they've been there. And when it finishes, it's the same. You walk out of the room and you think, well, they're still going. Yeah, I yeah. Come back in two years, and it'll be, it'll be yeah, person nine hundred. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's and it also sounds like very much like Lou Reed at a bar, yeah. and you're 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 on the bar stool, yeah. and he's just like you know like just yeah. candy came from the islands. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know like yeah. poker, you know. Yeah. And it felt it yeah. very offhanded. Yeah. Um, 
which I really like. Yeah, or, and it, it's a bit it's, no, it's it's a bit like Guys and Dolls updated. You know those the, yeah. those characters of yeah. these New York characters. Yeah. yeah. And like or something maybe from you know well obviously you know it's the Chelsea Hotel as well. Yeah. And it's yeah. you know Harry Smith probably a bit of that. You yeah, know, yeah. And it, and, and the, the sp I mean the production I mean yeah. it's just extraordinary. You know like something as sparse as that, but the production is genius yeah. by Bowie and Ronson, but. It's that Lou Reed vocal that, yeah. um, you know, you know, just lines like Valium would have helped that bash, yeah. you know, and just the way he just tosses it off is like, there was nothing like it on the radio at the yeah. time, and it really caught me. And like you mentioned it, I just said you weren't you weren't writing or singing or any, no. at that point yourself. No. Do you, do you think that in some way, but it did give you? Did do you think it gave you permission? When you, yeah, when you did. Did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hearing someone like like Lou Reed did, yeah, um, because on that recording, especially his vocal, he's doing a lot of stuff that is not no one else was doing, yeah. and getting on the radio. In a way, you know, like when I listen to it now, it's a little bit like Dylan Thomas. Yeah. You know, it's it's the voice. Mm. You know, it's a love of language, it's stories, um, which you know. Um, is something that I follow, yeah. and it could be no one else. You know that voice. It's it is just it's Lou Reed. There's, yeah, there's it, no is. Mistaking it is. It, you know? it is. It is. Yeah. But you know, like even when he was in the Velvets, he never did anything like mm. that's him almost talking. And like in the Velvets, um, which I investigated heavily over the next couple of years, um, you know, he, he's really singing, mm -hmm. and he's really tr like on something like Loaded. Um, he's really trying to sing rock and roll, yeah. and he. Um, but that is almost spoken word, yeah. um, and it's really good. And it's, I mean, it's, I think it's a great combination as well, as you said, because like we've Bowie and Ronson, who are yeah. full in your face yeah. um, at the time, you know, yeah. and, and Bowie's right at the front of the stage, yeah. Yeah. just this, enti this per entire persona with Ronson right beside him. Yeah. And they hook up with Lou Reed, and they, but their idea is, we're going to do something that works for you. Yeah. So we're not just going to transplant yeah. glam onto this and yeah. make it, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the genius touch. Yeah. And also, yeah, I think that they probably did it really quickly. I think that sure in the middle of yeah. Ziggy Mania. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it's an extraordinary record to become a hit record. Yeah. Definitely. And we're going to stay around the same era, generally, up to about 1973. Yeah. Um, and this is, it's a soundtrack song. Yeah. And uh, we, it was recorded in 1973 for a film that was made, a, a Western that was made yeah. in New Mexico. That's a, uh, another song. It does something sim very similar to Lou Reed. I really didn't have, wasn't exposed to, Bo, uh, to Dylan in the 60s. This is the first Dylan that I really heard. Um, so I don't come in on The Times Are Changing. I don't come in on Like a Rolling Stone. Um, I come in on that. Yeah. Um, and again, hearing it on the radio, Dylan sounds like he's about 800 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, It's just like he's tired, he's beaten. Yeah. Um, and like that just wasn't, that was new again. Mm -hmm. Um, that you could do something as slow as that, as grand as that, and um, and the lyrics, the, the song's really simple, um, very one of the simplest, really good songs Dylan ever wrote, and um, I just love that record. I love the reverb and the sound of it. Um, this sort of far away, yeah. like the band is playing it and the microphones are about a mile away, you know, and it's just like. This, you know, which again with radio, everything's super close and going for impact, you know. Um, again, to this day, um, and really in your face, and that's a long way away. Uh, but it was mainly, I'd never heard a voice like that on the radio. I must have been searching, like I really loved a lot of, you know, like, you know, like people that could sing mm. properly. Um, and were, and were classical rock singers or soul singers or pop singers. You know, I like lots of them. Yeah. But the, the voices that stuck out to me were something like that. And you've got to put in that context of 1973, 
Um, but again, you know, like you, if you listen to, uh, I don't listen to Top 40 radio or, 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 you know, like on TikTok or, you know, like whatever's going on now. But is there a voice as, as otherworldly and as ancient yeah. as that on the radio? It, and um, really slow, again, a little bit like I Can't Stop Loving You, really grand mm -hmm. and slow. Um, and, you know, it just really attracted me and I got a lot more into Dylan after that. Like, just the same way I did with Lou Reed. Like, hearing them on the radio got me into, when I, when I started to buy albums, these are the artists that I started to follow. And just on your... And I, this is... Everyone else can just ignore the rest. I'm going to just talk about Bob Dylan for the next six hours. Yeah. You know. um, does that still, is, as, your entra, as your entree, mm. does it still bring you back to that where you heard it? Or does it still have the same impact when you hear that now? Oh, no, it's still the same thing. Um, and I think, you know, Dylan is one of those um, where you come into it. Mm. Um, I have a theory. Um, I'll tell it to you. Um, I, I really think that there's two listening experiences. There's basically stuff that you hear after it's come out, years after it's come out. And so you're listening to it in your time. And so, and then there's stuff that you're listening to that has just come out that's contemporary. And so, and really you can never really listen to a record in a way, and this is an exaggeration, properly, if you're not hearing it in its contemporary context. Mm -hmm. And so... To give you an example, with, with, with Dylan, with Dylan, so with Highway 61, revisited one of his great albums that came out in 65, I know I can never hear that when it came out in 65. And so if I'd have heard that, I'm taking this example, if I'd have heard nine, um, Highway 61, revisited 1965 when it came out, I'd have been hearing radio for the months beforehand. I'd have been hearing Tamla Motown. I'd have been hearing... The Stones, I'd be hearing Smokey Robinson, I'd be hearing Peter, Paul and Mary, I'd be hearing the latest, the run of the Beatles singles, and then I'd hear Highway 61, knowing Dylan had heard all of that, yeah. and Dylan's doing something in that contemporary sphere. And there's a listening experience to that that you'll never get again. Which is not, it's not sad, no. but there's something about hearing something in its time that, you, that I can never hear you know, Joni Mitchell's blue in its time, you know. Um, and so that's the importance in a way of, of hearing that Dylan track is where I come in and I, can, I know that in 1973, that sat amidst <coughs> Ballroom Blitz by Sweet, yeah. <laughs> which Dylan probably wasn't listening to. No. But um, I know what was happening in the... Cin you know, like mm. I'd, I'd go and see The Sting with, with Robert Redford and Paul yeah. Newman. You know, I'd be listening to Sweet on the radio. There'd be something I'd watch from TV and another piece in that is Knock on Heaven's Door. Yeah. And that, in my mind, sets up that time. I think we can all, we all know those. I mean, 10 years later, I was in Dublin listening to the go-betweens. Right, yeah. And going, you know, and that, so the, the first time I heard that <laughs> yeah. was in that context, you know, mm. but, uh, with R.E.M. and mm. with Husker Du and with all the yeah. other things that were yeah. going on. Um, yeah. You know, so... I, yeah, I, we, I mean, we, that's, we that's, it, I that, yeah, that's putting it in its context. Yeah. And there, there's no, you know, like, the, you can't listen to everything in its time, yeah. 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 but... Um, and sometimes there's advantages listening to a record that came out in the 70s or 80s now for the first yeah. time. And there's a real pleasure, a different kind of pleasure, but... There's something about hearing it in its time that um, gives it a different context. Yeah, yeah. and then how, so, so if you, like this is, it, I mean, it's a really interesting place to start with Dylan, um, because it's past the madness of the mid '60s, and yeah. it's, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> and I presume you know it, when you started listening a bit more, you, yeah. you find out more and you dig your way back into yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you find any of it hard? Uh, did you find any of it awkward having this as your, your, your reference, your anchor point, if you want? No, no, it wasn't. When I was at university in the, like in, in the mid-70s, um, like early Dylan was still big. Yeah. And I made a point of it. I was not interested in the first four albums. Um, for me, Dylan started with Bring It All Back right. Home. 
I was interested in Dylan immediately as like amphetamine rock star. Yep. Um, and I was not interested in the dungarees and, and all, all of that. I knew they were good songs, yep. but that's what a lot of, you know, like hippies and, and people on campus, you know, and, and friends I knew were, were and I, I was like, no, I want the polka dot shirts, I want the sunglasses, yep. I want, um, you know, and, and that sort of related to Ziggy Stardust. Mm. Like that was Bowie, I could see, was doing. Mm. Bowie was burning in a way through Ziggy Stardust, the way Dylan was burning through Blonde on Blonde. Yeah. The only other artist that I, you know, like, that I saw doing something like that was someone like Judy Garland, you know, in the 60s. That sort of really living on, you know, the wire ends of your mind and, you know, like, just giving everything to your art and your life is basically non-existent. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's when... And when the go-between started, this is what I said. One of the things I brought to it to Grant, I was like, it's Dylan, it's Blonde on Blonde, it's Highway 61, mm. it's bringing it all back home um, and um, I'm not interested. And that's, that I found, found him fascinating at that time. Um, so that's where I went back to and that's where I, I kept it. Um, for a long time. And then when, when you met Grant then, um, was, was music the common, your, your, like your, your common chat, if you want? Was that a yeah. way of, I, mean, I suppose, again, it's, I suppose when we're all that age, sort of like sort of late teens going into yeah. early 20s, music is this lovely democracy about music that allows yeah. you just in. Yeah, yeah, yeah it did. It yeah. did. It did. And, and we were real sort of cherry pickers mm. of the past probably very self-consciously um, eclectic, yeah. um, but at the same time absorbing everything that was happening in punk and post-punk. Yeah. Um, and then you know, picking up bits in, in the, the 60s and 50s and early 70s. Yeah. And, and did, you, did, you, did you see the film? Did you see Pat Garrett and Blood, Billy the Kid? I, 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 did, I did, I did. I did many years later, yeah. Yeah, um, and loved it. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, his position in the film is beautiful. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah, cause the, just with, to finish, just, there's a lovely story. Jim Keltner, who's the drummer on the track, yeah. tells they they recorded the soundtrack in in Paramount Studios. Yeah. So he said when they were, it was in the sound studio, yeah. but it was just them yeah. in this giant sound studio with the screen. Right. And they were screening the film. Yeah. So he could get the feel for the yeah. scene. You know, and Keltner said, Keltner said he was just sitting there watching this, and Kathy Gerard was watching, you know, Slim Pickens die, and um, and then the song starts, and he said he's sitting there crying, yeah. and, and Dylan he just walks in, plays the guitar, walks out, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah. just yeah. floors everyone, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You you mentioned um, you, you mentioned there that these other influences you guys were starting to come under, you know, the more contemporary influences yeah. as you were getting a bit older, and. Um, your next choice of song then is is bringing us right up into, if you want, to the, the late seventies. Yeah. You know, kind of very contemporary, probably when you were in your early twenties, mid twenties. Yeah. Um. Twenty. I was in London when this came out. Um. Twenty-two. Yeah. I'd have and, been twenty. And magazine as the band. And yeah. It, to, I mean, to a certain extent, they were a bit like the Velvet Underground. It seemed to be like everyone who liked magazine formed the band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But ten years on, because yeah. you know, the Edge, Johnny Marr. Yeah. Morrissey, Johnny Greenwood, Ed O'Brien, yeah. Dave Navarro, of all, yeah. you know. Yeah. So this is, um, it, and of course, this is a band that was led by Howard Devoto, who'd, who'd left the Buzzcocks. Yeah. He was in the Buzzcocks, and then he formed Magazine, you know. Um, so yeah. we listened to a little bit of this. So it's a song from Under the Floorboards yeah. by Magazine. Uh, I first heard this, um, Grant and I were in London. We, we, we went over there in 79. So, and we're fans of, of Magazine. Um, when we were in Brisbane. And so we bought this when it first came out uh, in very early 1980. And I remember putting it on the record player. Um, and, um, and it just started. And it's, you know, you know, it was the I am angry, I am ill, and I'm as ugly as sin as the first line. And I was just like, what? <laughs> what? It was so brilliant. Because yeah. I'd never heard a singer do self-depreciation. Mm. I'd never heard a singer be hard on themselves. You know, I know the meaning of life and it doesn't help me a thing. Yeah. You know, and I was, every line of that song's a killer. And I was just like, oh, you can do all of this. I hadn't even thought of it, you know. Yeah. Um, 
And so, you know, the band's great. And, and, and I always go for the singers and what they're saying. You know, that's the theme you're picking up here. Um, and so the band's great, you know, like John McGeeck on guitar. Very influential. Um, Dave Formula on keyboards. Um, Barry Adamson on bass. Um, and, like, it's a great band, the best version of, of magazine. But then what I really love is the... The the chorus is really hooky, you know. Suddenly it goes down this and ba dum ba. You know, like any band can do that. You know, like a good pop band. That's a chorus. That's a really catchy chorus. Um, but it was Devoto's off-handed, self-lacerating, but very funny um, uh, lyric um, that got me, and and it just. Um, Although, you know, I didn't immediately turn and start to uh, write lyrics like that immediately, but it just was a big door opener for, for me where I could go as a writer and what it allowed you to do, and which I, which I keep to this day and which um, got me, definitely fired me through the 80s. Yeah. You know? And I think it, it's like you said, I think, I think on that notion of listening to something in the contemporary <coughs> sphere... 1980, you know, 1979, 1980, there's a lot of very serious young men and serious yeah. young women in bands. And yeah. as you said, the, his approach was this wholly other. Do you yeah. know? I mean, they were a very, they were a really good band. Yeah. But again, it goes back to that. Idea. It's the singer again and the song. Yeah. It's, it's another, it's a slightly off kilter thing. Yeah, um, it is. It and is. he's got, as you say, he's got a great chorus in there. You know? Yeah. I mean, Devoto was someone that Grant and I were very interested in um, because, as you said, he was in Buzzcocks um, and, you know, that first um, orgasmatic, mm -hmm. yeah, um, which we had and that was great and you'd think, well, there's your career, you know, like <laughs> you, you're going to stay in that band, Pete Shelley's going to write the mm -hmm. songs, he's obviously a great um, singer-songwriter, songwriter. you're going to do that. and then Devota left which immediately made him an intriguing figure for Grant and I. It was like, you know, like, that's, just, that's great. You know, like, you make one classic single, then you leave the band. Yeah. You know, what sort of person is this? Yeah. You know, um, fascinating in Manchester, looks like no one else, mm -hmm. um, and uh, sounds like no one else, and writes great words. Um, so we were intrigued with him. And then he went to magazine, and then, you know, shot by both sides, mm -hmm. you know, and singles like Touch and Go, we were buying every single, listening to every album. And so when we arrived in London, this was the new... We arrived there in November and, and this came out in December. And uh, so this was the next chapter, but we were experiencing it not in Brisbane getting the records weeks later. We are in London going into Rough Trade or HMB or wherever and buying it and going to a friend's... We didn't have a record player. Mm. Going to a friend's place putting it on, and it's like, okay, this is the next instalment. And then he comes out with, I am angry, I am ill, and I'm as ugly as sin, which was the best line he'd ever come up with. And we knew all the lines. And then suddenly that was the new opening line. And um, I just knew that I could be hard on myself and, if, and be, you know, there was, there was just fields I could go to I immediately knew in my head. Yeah. As a, you know, it'd take me time to get there and write that. Um, but, but that was a real sort of shot in my head, what that record was. Mm. And I think, you know, you can hear, uh, you can hear a little bit of, of you guys from 1983, 1983, 1983 mm. in, in, in the space in that song. I yeah, think yeah. It, it's, it's very, there's a lovely melody in chorus. The playing is really sparse. Yeah, it's just it's just doing what it needs to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and there's a lot of space. And again, you, like the production budget must have been nothing on this no. thing. You know, um, mm. and you can kind of hear it as well. Yeah. But, but they obviously didn't. He obviously didn't want to pack it. You know, it was just let's keep no, it really no, simple so no. the voice is right there. Yeah. You know? yeah. Another reason I think I like these records is you know like I'm not really into production. You know, like. You could probably talk to musicians and they'll be going, there's that, yeah. and that, that's in the mix, 
and then the violins come in and then there's you know a synth from you know Juno 6 from 19 you know <laughs> all of you know the Korg and all of that I like production um, but I'm not obsessed with it. Mm. It, it I like good rock production or pop production or folk production or whatever um, but it's not it's not my thing it's not the thing that it's it's those lines it's the singer um, it is the band bands are really important and I love them um, but I'm not a production person and so I, I the sparse of the records um, and the more I can hear the singer and the nuances in their voice the more interested you know like that yeah. grabs me and there's space in that the way there's space in Walk on the Wild Side or Knock on Heaven's Door you know yeah. uh, talking about production um, your next track is yeah. It's, it's, it's a slight turn, just slightly yeah. off, slightly left turn, maybe we just go that way. Um, it's a, it was a song that wasn't going to be on the album, yeah. but it, and it was recorded essentially overnight. All right. And everything's played by the singer, and there's no bass on it. So Prince and Doves Cry. Yeah, um, 1982, um, again, yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot of amazing production in that. But, but what I heard was, um, dig if you will, a picture, picture yeah. of you and I engaged in a kiss. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. You know, um, I like to, I, you know, right from the word thing, dig if you will. You know, not know if you will. Yeah. Dig, you know, late 50s um, beat, mm. you know, like jazz lingo, um, which I really liked. And I, I, I sort of used it. I've used that since the 70s. Yeah in a semi-ironic way. Um, and so I love the dig, you know, like the first word. Mm. To give you, Will, a picture of you and I engaged in a kiss. I just thought that was amazingly romantic. Uh, and I just love the feel and the sound of it. It sounded so fresh. Yeah. Um, it sounded so new. And it was like not, you know, like, baby, let's get it all night long. Let's dance all night long. Let's, you, you know, it's to give you will a picture of you and I engaged in a kiss. And I just thought that was really powerful. And um, he, was, he was sort of the person I listened to, the artist I listened to the most in the 80s. I followed him album to album and track to track. I found him really... I love with Prince. It was... Um, he was a virtuoso, but he was very playful. Very ironic, very um, the image, everything. I mean, we're talking about you know, like Bowie and Ziggy. We're talking about Dylan in the mid '60s when it's the you know like the curls and the shades and the suits. Um, this is what he was like the '80s version. Yeah. Like, like to me, it was like Dylan. I mean, you can go back and say like it was Elvis, Dylan, Bowie, Prince mm. um, were the sort of. Um, people that commanded a decade. And uh, I really followed him and loved what he did. He, he was great with language. He was great with melody. He was probably, uh, yeah, like really great with production, obviously, which I was, you know, like I'm interested in, as I said. But um, that was the entry point for me. I think it was for a lot of musicians, you know, like I, um, and people, you know, like, like fans, you know, like I think that record really caught everyone and was like, What's that? Yeah. yeah. And who's this? Yeah. Who's this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I suppose as well, the, it, as you say, he was, he was really the face of the, the 80s. Yeah. And playful and a fantastic musician. And the music just spilled out of him. Yeah. You know, you didn't know what the next album was going no, to be about. No, 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 no. And, and also in the 80s, you know, like everyone was, you know, like when you look at the major artists, the big sellers, especially from America. Yeah. You look at Madonna, you look at Springsteen, you look at Michael Jackson. Um, you know, especially Springsteen and Madonna, there's not... I didn't pick up too much playfulness at that time. They were very much... You know, like, in your face, you know, interesting... Um, where he was way... Yeah. You know, he commanded that space. It was hit after hit after hit. But really interesting. He, you know, like Raspberry Beret. Mm. You know, Kiss. I think, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just like the lyrics were just mind blowing. Yeah, and from 
this, you know, the psychedelic folk. Yeah, you know, yeah. To, to pure yeah. pop. You yeah, know. yeah. yeah. Um, he could do it all, yeah. and he could do the lyric. He'd have a different look. Yeah. Um, and he seemed to have a command of <coughs> musical history over the previous, going back to Little Richard or before Little Richard, all the way through the 60s, the 70s, and just be able to, Joni Mitchell, everything, and just being able to blend it without it being really serious or really studied. Yeah. It just seemed to come really naturally, him, this sort of playful, impish thing that I found really attractive in the mainstream. Because mm. in the 80s, it was very much the mainstream was like just loud noise often. And the underground was a real underground. It was interesting. Where he was the one person up there... There are other things going on that I liked. Um, but Prince was like, you know, he could have been on rough trade. Mm. You know, he could, have, he could have been in London floating around the underground in the 80s. Uh, he was that kind of person. Mm. Um, yeah. There's a, a great video, most people have probably seen it at this stage. It's the, the George Harrison tribute where he does While My Guitar mm. Weeps. And yeah. You know, God love whoever the guitarist is in the band. He has to do the George, you know, the Eric Clapton solo, which is a really good faithful yeah. solo. And then this thing wanders on from the other side yeah. of the stage. And what I think I love about it is at the end he takes the guitar off and he throws it in. The yeah, air I know that. And it doesn't come down. Yeah, I know. It's just you think it probably didn't. <laughs> it's just yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Still that, that, I, I know that moment. I've seen that, and I've seen the guitar throw yeah. at the end. Uh, but, and he's smiling the whole way through. Yeah. It's just this playful thing yeah. of, yeah. isn't this, look what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is. It's very much he's, he's, that solo when he's doing that, you know, it's a big classic rock yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, it's a rock, you know, while yeah. my guitar gently mm. weeps. Big rock classic. All the dudes are on there, the older dudes. And doing it all very, you know, like ceremoniously to George, which is understandable. Um, but he just comes on and she's just all light yeah. and feathers and just... And it's just like... And he lies backwards into the crowd. And, you know, it, and he's, just yeah, <laughs> it's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Right, we, we're just conscious of time here. So we, this is a, this is a real... Again, it's another... It's a shift to your next choice. Um, and we're, it's a singer... It, Aldous Harding, who's yeah. a, a singer-songwriter from, yeah. from New Zealand. Yeah. So, so it's the, the Barrel is the song. Mm. And it's from her third album, Designer. Yeah. Um, I heard that and basically I was really intrigued because I couldn't make out the lyric. You know, there's, you know, eating the peach and there's the nut. And that intrigued me as well. It was almost like going the other way. It wasn't like there's lots of really interesting information. Her voice is quite soft and buried a bit in the track. Mm. Uh, I love the instrumentation. I love the production. Um, and it was just... Um, she sort of deals in riddles a lot. Um, I'll just hiding. So that, that was my entry point with her. I knew, I knew she was around. I knew she'd done two, two albums. This was her breakthrough record. She's made one since. Um, and I really like Designer. Um, and that track just... And the video is very... Um, you know, like mind blowing, like very. She's a, like she's like a performance artist, um, which is again, and I think also um, what I liked about her was she's very, um, very playful again. Mm. You know, like she sort of does all these sort of facial stuff on stage, and you know, almost like characters and and all of that, um, which I can relate to. You know, like I, I sort of, you know, like you. you you know, like as an artist, you, you often think about... People tell you, oh, you like that, you like that, you like that. You know, like people compare you. Yeah. And often artists have other ideas of where they are. And so if, if someone was to say to me, like, name a couple of artists that you think are very similar to you, I'd name her. You know, like there's something about her performance, the way she carries herself, her just sort of these mm -hmm. movements that I can relate to mm -hmm. totally. Um, and um, she's sort of pulling poses and, and doing stuff, which I found... Um, she takes it to a whole other step. Yeah. She's, she goes more into, like, uh, performance art. Um, but I find um, 
I find her really, her lyrics are really, really uh, intriguing and I, I don't know what a lot of them mean, but I like the feel of them. Mm. Often, often artists, I don't know what their lyrics are or I can't hear them well. And I go, yeah. But that, I find, I can hear the bits I find really intriguing and I like the fact that she's playing with me yeah. and playing with text in a, in a pop song in a way and dropping these little bombs that you hear. I like that. Yeah. I, you're, you're right. I mean, when I listen to it, I hear you guys, but, but in, in the same way, not in, not in a copy way, yeah. but it's in the same sort of space. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think it's intriguing that you said that you, you would, if someone asked you who, who would... Who yeah. sounds like you? You'd put her in this space. Yeah, it was just this week. Um, REM, REM's office put out a Spotify playlist. All right. I don't know if anyone knows this. There's 40 tracks REM's office put out, 10 tracks by each, picked by each band member. Oh yeah. And loads of people have got on Twitter and said you've picked the wrong tracks. <laughs> right. You know, and you kind of think, you kind of think, well, they're their songs, and yeah. you, but they're not now. You yeah, know, yeah. It's they're. It's like your songs aren't your songs, they yeah. are your songs. There are songs. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think, again, when you listen to someone like Aldous Harding, you can see, I can hear you guys in her. Oh, right, Do yeah. You know, not copying you, but yeah. a space maybe you carved out has made space for other people like this, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, um, I was introduced to it by my son, you know, Lewis, yeah. who's, um, who's um, in his mid... Well, he was in his early 20s then. Um, and was in a band called the Goonsacks. And he said to me one day, um, soon after he came, he said, you've got to mm. listen to this, I think you'll like it. And he put on the barrel. And I was like, wow. you know. So he could sort of hear that I might go into that. Yeah. And I did completely. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I played it five times, and I was just like, this is the freshest and best thing I've heard for a while. So like back to being a teenager again. Yeah. Just listening again and again yes. and again. You know? yeah. yeah. Okay. This is your last track. Um, it's. Uh, uh, it, 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 I think you could read. There's lots of things you could read into this track, yeah. you know. But yeah. I suppose we listened to a little bit of it. Unfortunately, we might play out after we finished up. But we might play out with it as well. But we just listened to a bit of this to start. A boy in Berlin again. Yeah. Going back to Berlin. Yeah. Where are we now? Yeah. I. Um, this was the. To me, that's the best thing. You did since maybe Ashes to Ashes. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I heard that and I went, wow, he's just, he's just written. Um, the album, um, The Next Day That's Off, this is easily the best track for me. Um, the rest of the track, the rest of the album's okay. Where I love Black Star. Mm. To me, Black Star's in the top six albums Bowie ever made. Mm. And this is sort of, could be on Black Star. Yeah. Um, and so I can just remember hearing it and just hearing the production, hearing his voice, which, um, um, I love Bowie when he's like this. Yeah. Bowie, Bowie through the 80s, he started bellowing um, sometime <laughs> in the 80s and everything was like this raw. Um, and he can do it, you know. Mm. Um, and through the 90s and, and then this came out after all those years in 2015 or 16, whatever it was. No, he died in... Uh, 2014, yeah. 15, yeah. yeah. And this came out and it was like to me... This was like the same guy that did The Man Who yeah. Sold the World and Hunky Dory, did Low, um, did Ashes. You know, I was like, you've you've updated, and this is otherworldly and just so pretty, so beautiful. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, just uh, Bowie was Bowie was always really important to me through the seventies. He 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 was the artist that I had my eye on, that I bought record to record every day, uh, every year that he put out a new record. Um, and so, and I didn't really, f he lost me in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, and then this came back, and then Black Star. To me, to me it's, just the, it's the melody. He, he can sort of do something with melody, Bowie, that is really unexpected, yet classical and melodic at the same time. You listen to that climb, and he's just lurching a bit, and you go, yeah, that actually works, and yeah. that works. And then you listen to something like, like, it's like Ashes to Ashes. Ashes to Ashes is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. There's about eight songs in there, <laughs> and he puts it in one, and then, then he'll just do a little bit, and you'll go, that's beautiful. Anyone else would repeat that 16 times. Yes. And then he does another bit that's even better. 
and there's like, until he gets to the chorus, you know, ashes to ashes, <laughs> da 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 da. Um, there's been about 12 really good bits. <laughs> and it's like that as well. Like, you just sort of go, oh, that's beautiful. That could go on and, you know, just sort of move yep. on. Then he does a turn, and then he does a turn, and then there's that classic swell, and it's just like, it's just something he can do. Yeah. Um, an incredible songwriter. And I, you're right, I think, probably like a lot of people, I suppose, he was, whatever, he, whatever was going on in his life, and he was trying to find space yeah. for and trying to find things. And maybe it was, maybe it's a little bit like some of the Dylan, later Dylan stuff, it's really finding confidence in the songwriting and in yeah. themselves. Because the thing that's great about this is how unhurried it is. Yeah. He's yeah. in no rush. Yeah. Yeah. And you really get a sense he's just walking around Berlin. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and going, oh, yeah, there's there. And it's, there's gr there, and it's great know. that that was the single that he yeah. put out. Yeah. Like, because it just completely left-footed everybody yeah. to pick that track off the album yeah. and tell the record company. Yeah. It's the best track on the, yeah. the, the re yeah. record by some distance. But, you know, it's not a single. And to put it out after, you know, what was it, an eight-year absence yeah. or something, really bold, really Bowie. Yeah. And, and that end, you know, where he does the, you know, as long as there's sun, as long as there's rain, as long as there's you, yeah, yeah. as long as there's oh. me. You know, that thing, it's, it reminds me of, you know, um, Harry Smith's anthology. Yeah. On the cover of it, he's this celestial monochord. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, was the instrument. You could, yeah. The one-stringed instrument that united everything. Yes. And you think, in a way, this is Bowie's celestial monochord. Yeah, yeah. Right at the end, he just... Mm. And you're right, I think this song really should have closed... Black Star. It could have. Because you just think, this is a benediction, it's a prayer. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's him also saying, I'm David Bowie, and yeah. you're not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, he's, I always thought Bowie um, obscured his songwriting. You know, yeah. to me, you know, like even in the 70s when I was living it in real time, you know, Bowie, I'd go on about theatre and kabuki theatre and the characters, and I always, I, I always found it a little bit corny. I mean, like, I'd always go... Yes, and I know all that's important, but you wrote Hunky Dory. You know, like, <laughs> you're the best. You know, like, after Lennon McCartney, it's you. You know, it's like, you're an amazing songwriter, yet you, you know, he's got the face and, you know, there's the, the mime and all of that. I always found it a bit hokey. And, and uh, I love Bowie as a singer-songwriter. Um, um, above everything else. Yeah. And I think a lot of songwriters do. I think that's why everyone loves, like singer-songwriters love Hunky Dory because it's the best yeah. songs he ever wrote. It's the best batch. Um, yeah. uh, and it was before he became Ziggy. You know, he's a hippie in Beckham smoking pot with a 12-string and a piano and he's playing about two gigs in the year. That's when he's writing. Yeah. And he's 24. Yeah. That's... You know the mother loads it's the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. and um, but yeah, but he comes. He's comes back. Yeah. Robert, thank you so much for doing this. Pleasure, um, absolute pleasure. It's it's been a joy to talk to you, and it's been a joy to play some of the music and listen to some of the music. So, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Foster. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this episode. For more episodes, visit giaf.ie or find the First Thought podcast on any podcast platform. First Thought is presented in association with the University of Galway.